Before proceeding, please make sure to subscribe and turn on the bell icon for upcoming videos. Radicular cyst, also known as periapical cyst or apical periodontal cyst, arises around the apex of a non-vital tooth. It's the most common inflammatory odontogenic cyst. By inflammatory odontogenic cyst, it simply means that the cyst arises as a result of progressive inflammation of the pulp of a tooth into its periapical area, which causes subsequent stimulation of some cells around the apex of a tooth. These stimulated cells leading to the origination of the cyst are the epithelial rests of molasses. The epithelial rests of molasses are the remnants of Hertwig's epithelial root sheet, which are left after root of a tooth is completely formed. The source of inflammation of the pulp most frequently is a carious lesion. However, trauma or defective restorations could also be a cause of this pulpal inflammation of a tooth. As soon as these epithelial rests of molasses around a tooth apex are stimulated by a pulpal inflammation, the cyst origination begins. And this origination of the cyst is accomplished in four main stages. These stages are named as the initiation, the proliferation, the cystification and the enlargement phases. In the initiation phase, the bacteria or the inflammatory cytokines from the inflamed pulp stimulates the cell rests of molasses, located near the apex of the associated tooth. In the proliferation phase, as the name suggests, these cells of molasses excessively proliferates around the root apex, resulting in a large mass of cells located around the periapical region of a tooth. In the phase of cystification, the peripheral cells of the epithelial mass get adequate nutritional supply from the surrounding blood vessels. But the central cells of the mass are deprived of any nutritional supply as a result of which the central cells of the epithelial mass undergoes ischemic liquefactive necrosis, while their peripheral cells survive. This eventually gives rise to the formation of a centrally placed cavity surrounded by a peripheral outline of epithelial cells. In the enlargement phase, the degraded central cells leads to a high osmotic pressure within the cystic lumen. This high osmotic pressure within the cystic lumen results in absorption of further fluid from surroundings into the cystic lumen. In addition, in order to accommodate this extra fluid, the peripheral cells secrete certain enzymes like collagenases in order to resorb the surrounding bone, hence facilitating expansion of the cyst. Two variations of radicular or periapical cyst are known so far. These are the periapical pocket cysts and periapical true cysts. Periapical pocket cyst is characterized by an incomplete epithelial lining around a tooth apex. This incomplete epithelial lining of the cyst results from extension of the apical portion of the root into the lesion. The periapical true cyst is characterized by an epithelial lined bag like structure that is adjacent to but separated from the tooth apex. Or let's say the apex of the tooth does not extend into the cystic lumen. Let's now talk about some clinical features of the cyst. In about 60% of all cases, radicular cyst most frequently affects maxillary jaw, with the maxillary molars being the most commonly involved teeth. The associated tooth is always symptomless and non-vital and does not respond to thermal and electric pulp testing. Pain may be present if the cyst is secondarily infected resulting in intraoral or extraoral sinus tracts. 
the cyst varies in size. Smaller cysts are detected accidentally only during routine radiographic examination. However, larger cysts produce bony enlargement or even bony fractures of the jaws. Sometimes the inflammation can stimulate the rests of molasses located adjacent to a lateral canal of the tooth, resulting in a lateral periodontal cyst and is just like a periapical or radicular cyst. If the cyst persists after extraction of the involved tooth, the cyst is called a residual cyst. Radiographically, the cyst appears as a well-defined radiolucency adjacent to the apex of a tooth. The well-defined radiolucent zone is surrounded by a radio-opaque rim. The cyst sometimes may cause resorption of the associated tooth. In radiography, since periapical cyst resembles a periapical granuloma, that's why radiographic examinations cannot be used as a definitive diagnosis. Histopathologically, three areas can be identified. A cystic cavity filled with fluid and cellular debris, which is lined by a non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and a fibrous capsule. The epithelial lining is about 6 to 20 cell layers in thickness. The thickness of the lining epithelium is not uniform throughout its periphery. Some mucus secreting goblet cells resulting from the metaplasia of some cells of the lining epithelium can also be observed. The lining epithelium may also demonstrate linear or arch-shaped eosinophilic calcifications, known as hyaline or Rushton bodies. The fibrous connective tissue wall of the cyst often have some chronic inflammatory infiltrates like lymphocytes, plasma cells, mast cells, macrophages and some other inflammatory cells. Cholesterol clefts are often seen in the fibrous capsule arising from the degradation of the epithelium or the inflammatory cells. Coming to the treatment, small cysts can be treated with non-surgical conventional endodontic therapy. If the tooth does not respond to endodontic therapy, then extracting the tooth becomes the only choice. Lesions larger in size and exceeding 2 cm in diameter are treated with a periapical surgery. If you think this video was really helpful, please do like the video and subscribe the channel. If you have got any questions or suggestions, you may write them down in the comment box. Thank you for watching.